What's up, you little alien weirdos that have been hidden by the government for years and only come out right now from declassified texts? How's it going? It's me, Craig, from the Downbeat Podcast. When I record these, right, I go into like a zen state. I never watch these back afterwards. I do them, forget that they're going to go on the internet, potentially seen by like thousands of people, and then I realise I probably said some dumb stuff. That one was maybe the dumbest intro. Let's get straight into it. <sighs> Give me some support, would you? <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash downbeat. It's a quid. You get early access to these. You get early access to merch. You get tons of stuff for one pound. Why is it a pound? I believe the downbeat to be 10% as good as Spotify. And that is 10% of Spotify. Ignore the tax that they add on. That's not my fault. That is the fault of the government that is hiding those aliens that I talked about earlier. If you don't want to go to Patreon and give me a pound, you can go to www.www.www. Don't put all those in. The downbe.at, so it spells downbeat. Pick up a shirt, pick up a beanie. You could maybe even pick up a jacket by this point. You could pick up a lovely um, look, a hoodie with like an embroidery, like a nice warm one, heavy for winter. Is it a streetwear brand? Is it a podcast? Uh, no one knows by this point. www.thedownbe.at I'd love you to pick something up before I talk about my guest this week who, it was an alien to me, very alien based this. He was an alien to me, I didn't know him, but I'm a massive fan of his band. Let's talk about the sponsor of today's podcast, Displate. Displate make metal posters if you're watching this on youtube.com. Number one, press subscribe. Number two, you can see in the background a lovely Akira one and a downbeat one. The posters are made from metal, there's no paper, there's no mess, there's no drilling. They got everything you could possibly want on that store. They got anime, they got movies, they got games, they got random like live, laugh, love stuff. And on the flip side of that, they got like wacky live, laugh, love. If you're like a live, laugh, limp biscuit kind of person, they got that stuff too. Listeners of the Downbeat Podcast can get 22% off one to three displays or 33% off three or more by going to displate.com and using the code DOWNBEAT. It supports the podcast, it supports me, it supports your walls looking sick AF. Check it out. My guest this week is Daniel Tracy of the band Death Heaven. Not to be confused with Death Havana, who have also been on the podcast. Very different music. He plays the drums in Death Heaven. He is a very fast, very blasty drummer. They are, without question, one of my favourite metal bands. They mix like a shoegaze element with actual black metal without any of the like dodgy connotations that black usually comes with black metal. We caught up the day of their core festival. I was super stoked that he messaged me saying he wanted to do the pod and I was like, funnily enough, I'm a massive fan. So we talk a ton, an absolute ton about their re-release of Sunbather, one of my favourite albums of all time. It comes out tomorrow, November, provided you're listening to this when it releases, which I hope you are, it comes out tomorrow, November 17th, re-release of one of the, I'll just go out and say it, one of the best albums of all time. There was tons of stuff I wanted to know about the interludes, about his drumming, I found out insane stuff about the recording process. One of my favourite things to do on the downbeat is when I interview someone I don't know, but I am like a stan of. Daniel Tracy is one of those people. Death Heaven is one of those bands. It's Daniel Tracy of Death Heaven on the Downbeat Podcast. Daniel Tracy. Craig Reynolds. Welcome to the downbeat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good is it, to be here. Is it Dan or is it Daniel? I go by Dan usually. Dan. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, since uh, since seventh grade. That was when the, the big change happened. The big change from mm -hmm. Daniel. Daniel. What, what age is seventh grade? Uh, for us, it would be 12 or 13. I was a little young for my grade, so I was uh, 12. And then you made the decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I just didn't, didn't want to go by Daniel anymore. I don't know why. I was like, I want to... I reinvent myself a little bit i was starting to listen to a lot of metal you know discover metallica stuff yeah. like that and i feel like a dan these days so i feel yeah. like a dan you got any other nicknames um no i did move from the bay area to orange county when i was 16 and everyone called me san fran dan san so fran dan was a thing for a minute wait That's, so that again you moved from i moved from the bay area to orange county when i was 16 so um i was born in socal moved to the bay when i was 10 uh, moved back down when I was 16, 
moved back up when I was 22. That's um, interesting. But for a period of time, I was known as San Fran Dan. San Fran Dan. Don't say that too many times because that will stick. I don't mind it. You'll have people. <laughs> I mean, you're back in San Fran now, so yeah. you are San Fran Dan. I'm officially, actually San Fran Dan. What was the reason for the move in? Uh, I just, I love the city so much. And um, you know, I did kind of my growing up years in the East Bay in a town called San Ramon. Um, it's actually where I met Shiv, our guitar player. Uh, that same year when I was 12, seventh grade. You've known each other that long? That long, yeah. It's kind of a thing with Deaf Heaven is that I would say we're almost two sets of best friends. George and Carrie grew up together since they were 14 or something like that. And then Shiv and I grew up together since we're you know, 12 or 13. And then we got Chris, our bass player, you know, maybe six or seven years ago. But other than that, it's it's kind of nice having those those factions where we're just kind of inseparable no matter what, you know. And uh, yeah, it's been great. How did you meet? So the other, where did the other two grow up? Uh, so they're from Modesto. Um, George and Carrie are from Modesto, and they moved. Where's that? Where's that? Oh, so that is Central Valley, California. Okay, it's almost like smack dab in the middle between LA and SF. And uh, I didn't spend a whole lot of time out there. Um, and if you don't know anyone, anyone out there, it's kind of why would you visit it? I mean, you, you're aware of Bakersfield and Fresno. Yep, I know that, those corn, that, corn and yep. then. I feel like there's a lot of new metal from Fresno. Maybe. It's kind of the vibe. I mean, uh, that band Edema, which I think they're related to Jonathan Davis. Yeah, that, that whole new metal vibe is is alive and well in, in Central Valley. Um, but How yes, old are you? I'm 35. 36. Um, right on. And there's going to be some interesting metal questions then. We've, we've, <laughs> same era. We've grown up in exactly the same <laughs> yeah. era. Seen the uh, the progression. Uh, but yeah, uh, I met Shiv when I was 12. He had just moved from Africa. Uh, he grew up in Kenya. And uh, they moved to New Jersey for a little bit, but they didn't like it, so they moved to the Bay Area. And um, he was just kind of this like odd kid in my class, and he was wearing a metal shirt. I was wearing a metal shirt. I was like, what's up, bro? And I was like, what's up, bro? <laughs> Do you remember what the shirts were? Uh, I, I'm assuming it was Metallica or Pantera or Slayer, because we're pretty, you know, we're dipping our toes at that point. Yeah. Um, but I definitely... Uh, distinctly remember blasting Sepultura in our PE class, our gym class when we were 13, bringing a boombox to PE class, and everyone was like, what the hell is wrong with these kids? I so, feel like we would have been friends. Oh, yeah. That was me as well. 100%. Same age, same bands. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what it, what it was. Like, a lot of people at the time, like, I did, you know, I did have a new metal phase as well, but it didn't start with that. It was Metallica. I think that was the thing. You get into Metallica, you get into the old school metal, and you see like, oh, what's popping now? Like, what's the current metal? Yeah. And it's definitely new metal at the time, so it's kind of unavoidable to fall down that path a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The, but the uh, the Metallica to Sepultura pipeline is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. Go, yeah. Is there, what if there was another band that was just a little bit faster, that still had the acoustic guitars and still had all this mm. straight in? Right. And when I found Pantera was over, I was just like, this is my band. So I sick. I found Sepultura and Pantera on the same day. So sick. Far Beyond Driven and Arise. Nice. I bought them at a garage sale because I was buying, what was I buying? The Beavis and Butthead compilation. No, I had the Beavis and Butthead compilation and I was there was a guy that was selling all these CDs. I always wonder about this old guy, like... Is he dead now? Or what? This is a oh, long yeah. time ago. But he was like, if you like that, you're going to like those two. And that was it. Nice. I mean, my mum put it on on the way home. It's a bit big figure for you. Kind of put you on. Yeah. So check this out. Just like, some guy. That's sick. Just some guy. <laughs> nice. Um, welcome to Glasgow. Thank you very much. You uh London yesterday? Uh, yeah. So, well, no, actually, we were in um, Arc Tangent. We played Bristol. Uh, oh. was yeah. The lineup was so good. It was fun. It was cool. Um, our day, we didn't really know too many people on our day, but it was a good time. It was cool. It was, uh, we played our tangent back in 2015 as well, and um, super fun, and uh, it's good to be back. Kind of a similar vibe, just out in you know, the, the greenery of, of England, just really beautiful scenery, and yeah, it was fun. I've never been. Like, I see it every year. The lineup is insane every year, mm -hmm. and I've always got something on where I'm just like, oh, I just can't go. Yeah. There's a lot of festivals out here, huh? especially this time of year. Every right? weekend. This, yeah. yeah. I'm always either away playing them or some like this This year is like something up with this. Are you doing 
10 year sunbather uh so we we are doing a few sunbather sets this year um we did that uh yesterday at arc tangent it's it like a whole record a whole record front to back are you yeah. doing that tonight no Motherfucker. so it's kind of a kind of a radius thing where it was an arc tangent exclusive so oh, we can't. Yeah. you have to you <laughs> even, have even to if we wanted to we, we couldn't yeah did you play so did you play two sets or did you just play that back to front we just played it just front, front to back yeah and uh, we actually just have it back to front, front to back <laughs> yeah we have it set up where um uh George, or sorry carrie and shiv they worked out how to play the interludes so there's like a couple of things on tracks but they're actually doing the guitars live cool. um, which is actually kind of awesome because uh george uh chris and i just kind of dip we leave the stage for a few minutes between every song catch our breath and then come back out all refreshed so it's kind of fun yeah it's a lot it's of weird a it's lot like of blasting <laughs> yeah it's a lot of blasting for sure we used to play that set when that record came out um initially and we would just rip through the songs there would be like 30 seconds between songs so i played the whole fucking album just like literally front to back and by the end of the set i would puke i would pass out it was a crazy period of time where i was just like running myself ragged someone once sent me unsolicited i might say so i'm not going to say who it was <laughs> okay a video of you because they knew i was a fan of the band this is ages ago this sure. must have been somebody the right somebody the tour and i'm sure it was you and you were blasting obviously doing the, and in between songs you were dunking your arms into ice buckets oh okay so yeah i actually still do that that's something i currently do give me the juice yeah uh so i wish i didn't have to but it's a carpal tunnel issue that i have um i think just so many years of playing those those beats and playing those songs um and just not really taking care of myself not doing stretches not doing icing or anything like that kind of caught up with me and um i actually distinctly remember the moment when um it started to all kind of go wrong was uh we were trying out um not trying out but we were having a fill-in bass player back yeah. in 2017 and um we were teaching him the songs and we were sitting there in our practice space for like nine hours just playing these sunbather songs and these new bermuda songs over and over and over again i just didn't really think about it and i just kept going and going and going and by the time i was done you know, like nine hours in my wrists were just completely swollen it was like a mountain like right here it was just and i was like oh my god what the fuck is happening here and uh it kind of tripped me out and i didn't really know what to do for the longest time i just kind of played through it just kept going you know and uh my tour manager uh, edgar we're on a tour with this will destroy you a couple months later he's Fucking like dude amazing band incredible band it was such an awesome Unbelievable. tour yeah um but he's, he kind of saw me suffering i was taking like four advil before the set just to try to get the swelling down he's like dude fuck this man i'm just gonna put a bucket of ice next to you just when your wrists are hurting just throw it in the ice i was like i don't know if that's gonna work it sounds kind of like you know you're supposed to stay warmed up you don't want to like cool yeah. down right i was like it sounds kind of antithetical or whatever but um i'll try it and it worked like a charm it was perfect it's like as soon as i play or finish like a song that's really intense put the six down dunk the hands and it kind of just brings the swelling down kind of brings you back to baseline so it's still it's still an ongoing issue yeah it's still something i do which it's not as big of an issue anymore because uh some of our newer songs are a little more mellow and i don't have to blast the entire time um so that gives me a little break but it's just something i've noticed really helps i just uh get the ice on the, the wrists and it kind of brings it back to baseline it's almost like you started the set over and you don't have all the like the the rigors going through your you know wrists so that works works pretty well for me i mean that's yeah, it sucks that you're going through that but you've obviously found something that works i think i just i i played in a style for a lot of years that was just really fast and i didn't like hold back i was just ah. and i don't know there's so many years you can do that until it starts to kind of tear up your wrists i guess have you got a, like a specific warm-up routine now uh that's the thing i i don't <laughs> even even after that oh my god i don't know, I don't know if i learned my lesson it, it, it it, i don't know every, every, every my whole attitude towards warming up is 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 kind of weird because i feel like it just makes me more tired and i'd like to save that energy for the set you do have so many notes it's just a lot of playing for a drummer there's so yeah. many kicks and so many snares it's a lot of playing and if i'm in the last song of like you know a 75 minute set and i'm locking up i'm like why the fuck did i warm up i shouldn't have warmed up and kept the strength for the set kind of thing you know yeah. so i don't know it's kind of a balance i try to keep it's the set have you found the faster songs are getting sort of by the wayside as you get you know as the 
career mm. progresses or are you always going to have to play them? I've got songs where I'm like, I can't wait till we don't have to play this oh. song anymore because <laughs> it's really <laughs> hard. No, I'd say we're, we're, we're always going to play them for sure. I mean, I, I, I don't think we'll ever play a show without playing Dreamhouse at the oh, end yeah. of the day. So I would be furious. I think everyone would. You. I think everyone would. And we, yeah. We're aware of that. So yeah, we're, we're definitely going to play, play the hits as they say. Is that the set closer? God, I love you. I, I said it to you <laughs> personally, but not to the podcast. I love your band so much. Oh, thank you. Hell yeah, I appreciate that. I remember it. <laughs> oh, excuse me. In, lit, exactly <clears throat> the same. There's very few bands that I remember exactly where I was the first time I heard it. Death Heaven, China. I was in oh, nice. China on tour. Very cool. On a, it was horrific. The tour was like, every show had like two people there. Oh no. We were <laughs> malnourished. We hadn't slept. There was any of this and stuff. You're, you're that far from home. So you're like, oh. And it was, yeah. And it was 2013. It was summer 2013. And that album had just been popping off and I'd never heard of Death Heaven before. And then someone was like, oh, it's like, it's like black metal with the gaze. And I was like, fuck off, is it? <laughs> and then I just popped it on. I, was, I remember exactly where I was in this shitty little Chinese van <laughs> going. We were actually, it was the best day of that tour. It was the last day of the tour. We were going to uh, the Great Wall of China. So, obviously, it's the, awesome. You know, it's the, yeah, I've never been, so that's cool. Popped it on and just immediately was just like, oh my God, this is incredible. Okay. Fell asleep during one of the interludes, which I do want to, I do want to ask some questions about the interludes. Yeah. Fell asleep during one of the interludes. Can't remember which one. It's kind of a compliment. And, I like that. Oh, no, I, and it became Hypnotic. my sleeping album on tour yeah. because nice. the blast, I don't know about you as a drummer, blast mm. like lull me to sleep For as sure. well. I'm a big blast beat guy, but this has enough up and down. Mm -hmm. But I think it's whatever the interlude is before the, you would say the pecan tree. Pecan. I would say the pecan tree. The pecan. Oh. Well, it's, it's even a thing in the States be, uh, between a pecan or a pecan. Uh, so what would you call that song? I say pecan, but Carrie says pecan. <laughs> so yeah, I interesting. Mean, it literally varies between Americans too. It was the, it was the interlude before that song, and then it woke me up so so aggressively when that song Pecan it, Tree it come, starts with the blast. Comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Some um, fucking rules. That interlude is, is particularly funny. It's a... Uh, field recording from that's what i wanted to ask you sure yeah yeah what, what, what are they because one of them has two yeah so so this would be the interlude that has the field recordings from uh san francisco um it's just you know sounds of the city essentially yeah and uh it's actually also carrie being in a, a the downtown kind of sketchy area just hanging out with sketchy homeless people and just getting like just getting just the vibe of that entire feel of being in that area of the city which is so unique you know have you been in the tenderloin downtown san francisco <sighs> It's essentially uh, right by Union Square. Um, I've, right do, I've done, I'll tell you where the venues I've played and you can tell me if I'm sure. anywhere near these. Warfield. Yeah, it's literally there. So Warfield's on Market, which I used to live right around the corner from for 10, for 10 years. Um, and that's, that's, that's Market Street. But right above that is the Tenderloin, which is essentially the open air drug market of San Francisco. I do remember it being kind of sketchy. It's just, it's junkie land you know what i mean just tent cities just insanity so we, I don't know, we just kind of wanted to capture some of that that atmosphere because that's what we lived in that's what we experienced and if, you know if we're gonna make an album about ourselves we wanted to include that for sure so what they just went around with a recorder yeah yeah sketchy <laughs> in the pocket or in the pocket it was his phone just phone recordings i've tried to decide see i didn't know this i've tried to decipher what it is a bunch of times because i feel like if i'm thinking of the same interlude that pan one way and there's something else pan the other way sure and then the other one is uh is a street preacher that's yeah, what i thought just, that just was a guy just screaming about the fires of hell you know downtown sf trying to it's, save the sinners it's amazing because you can hear a drug deal happening right in one i don't want to say it but yeah in, well, yeah in one <laughs> end we can, we can say whatever the hell we want um <laughs> you can hear a drug deal happening in one ear right and then the street preacher in the other ear and then it, it, is it the one before the pecan tree it is yeah. which is my favorite song on the album those oh, if you don't know this band come on get involved <laughs> yeah it was fun to make i had actually just met those guys maybe four months before we recorded that record so you weren't on the first record no i was not on the first record um actually when i met those guys they were in a little bit of a difficult situation they had lost their band essentially everyone that they were playing with had kind of left them behind and wasn't willing to travel, wasn't willing to play. There wasn't a lot of money involved back then, you know. Uh, but I had met them and they were kind of, they're ready to hang it up. They're like, yeah, we don't even know if our band's going to be anything. I was like, well, I'm here. 
and uh, tried, tried me out. We ended up playing Violet together. And they're like, you're the guy. And like that same night, we ended up, uh, uh, Carrie ended up showing me a couple of riffs from Dreamhouse. And he's like, yeah, just like, this would be a blast. Maybe freak out on the second part. And we put it together and we're like, this sounds fucking sick. And from then on, we knew it was, it was meant to be. And, and after that practice, I was like, so what do you guys do? Like, you know, what kind of guys are you? And they're like, I don't know. We should go to the bar and, and chat. And I was like, we should get a flask of whiskey and walk over and chat about it. And immediately just started vibing and led a similar lifestyle, you know, similar viewpoint of, of everything. And um, then eventually we needed a uh, guitarist. And I knew the perfect guy, you know, my best friend, Shiv, who was, I was, I was in a different band called Creepers at the time with. And uh, just made the most sense that he joined up with us, and yeah, we've never looked back. Amazing. Yeah, lineup's been the same. Uh, uh, my, bassist, except for the bass player. Oh, uh, our, our original bass player in that era was uh, Steve Clark, who is a super good friend that we had the craziest experiences with, the wildest tours. And um, I think he kind of had a different vision of what he wanted to do, so he ended up parting ways. And then we got um, our original sound engineer, uh, Chris Johnson. We had worked with him a few times in the past, and we loved his energy. He knew he was an incredible bassist. And once uh, Steve was kind of on the way out, I was like, oh, I know the perfect guy. And uh, we call him Kush, affectionately, um, Chris Johnson. Kush, Kush with a K? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, is, he, yeah. is he the weed guy? Well, we're all weed guys. You're all the weed guys. But it was, it was, it was, <laughs> it's a little cruel, but when, whenever we get a new guy in the crew, we kind of like, you know, rib him a little bit. We call him something funny. And I was like, I want to call him, like, Chris, I'm going to call you Piss. <laughs> but immediately it was so sweet and so just kind and cool to be around i was like i, I want to call this fool something that i really love i'm gonna call you kush <laughs> and he's nice. just, he's been kush ever since so and he he joined back in uh early 2017 and he's been a solid member ever since so nice. yeah what's your uh pre pre-show kush ability do you do uh, it or are you it's kind of just perpetual for me is it? Yeah. I wish I was you. I, I used to be able to smoke. I used to I used to love it. I was talking about this yesterday, actually. Mm -hmm. Used to be like a, you know, not like a stoner, but like I used to love it. I sure. Would, just to relax. Right. And then one day something just snapped in my head. I feel like that's a really common occurrence. I've I heard that a lot. It. Yeah, just kind of just get in your own head, just start overthinking things kind of thing. Even, yeah. and it comes in waves because there mm. was a time when, when you know when one one to one came out like oh, right, CBD, the CBD. To T, CBD to THC because I, I tried CBD and I was like this is not doing anything it's kind of placebo in my opinion I don't know. but the one to one stuff because mm -hmm. it just ends up with a weaker THC right like the ratio I could smoke that for a while and then that went as well I'm just like I can't do fucking anything I've heard that like CBD can actually be like a like a like remedy to being too high yeah like if you're just like really stoned if you take some CBD it can like reduce it but i don't know it's just something that kind of vibes with me and oh, wait, um, i wish maybe it's just being a california person it's kind of always been in the conversation it's always been around and i've always preferred it to alcohol just because alcohol is a lot harsher on your system it causes a lot more destruction in general um so yeah i think it gets a bad rap but being from california it's very much as part of our culture yeah i need i need i need to get back back on it because <laughs> I need I'm one of those people I need like a little bit of I need a little just escape sometimes sure and with well, weed I, gone it's alcohol and it's like that's not great for me I mean at the end of the day it is just a habit you know it costs a lot of money you know I wouldn't recommend it to someone who isn't already but for I started, me it, it I started works. vaping t uh, nicotine for, oh yeah for for fun mm -hmm. on our last tour because I was really bored I was just <laughs> I'm just gonna start vaping <laughs> yeah. and then I got home and I was like this is ridiculous so I had to quit that Right now, I need like I need one vice. Yeah, I think that's true with everyone. Like I, I um, did a booze-free tour last year. Um, I don't drink a whole lot, but for sometimes I just need to say no for a while. And I started vaping nicotine too. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, On tour? Yeah, I was like, I need something destructive to do. I used to smoke cigs. I was a cigarette smoker for a long time. But it was the same thing. I did a, you know, I did a dry tour, and yeah. I was like, nah, I Dude, need something. It's almost like a sober guy uh, like habit. You know, yeah. like, it's like a big thing and. You know, I don't go to recover, recovery personally, but I feel like if I were to, I would see a lot of elf bars up there, a lot, oh. of, you know, a lot of vapes in general. I think, yeah, people just need something to, some kind of vice, some kind of thing to. It did work though. Yeah. I don't know about you. It worked. No, for totally. me. I, I didn't drink for the whole, uh, maybe like two days at the end when I was like party time. But... Sure. Yeah. No, I lasted for you know six or seven weeks, and it was cool. Do you still vape or did you quit? 
I do. You do? Yeah. yeah. See, I, I quit and it was quite easy. So I was like, I'm just going to do that again. When I go on tour, I'm going to start vaping again. I think that's the thing they say that about uh, uh, nicotine vapes versus cigarettes is that there are more addictive chemicals in the cigarette. So it's easier to quit vaping. Cigarettes still, I haven't smoked since I was like 21. Cigarettes still, I still watch someone smoke a cigarette in a movie and I'm like, fuck yeah, that yeah. looks cool and that's awesome. Why, that's why everyone smoked movies. You know what I mean? Like my absolute favorite in the movie, favorite movie in the world, The Lost Boys, the nice. 80s vampire flick. It's sick in every scene. I'm like, I want to be like that. It's, it's very <laughs> on brand. That's your favorite movie. Uh, something I like to do sometimes on the podcast you want to give me your top five movies? Top, oh, wow. That's incredibly difficult. I could try. You can just, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll prize them out of you. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, well, Lost Boys always is up, is up there. Um, I'm a huge horror fan, so it's got to be up those. Like, oh, I could talk about horror all day. Same. I love Carpenter is my favorite director. Yeah. So 78 Halloween all day. Um, top five, though. Jesus. I guess I'll just go with that genre. Yeah, give me top five horror I mean, movies. The Thing. The Thing, I feel like this is controversial. But as you can see by the lighting set up here, I'm an A24 junkie, right? <laughs> the Thing is my favorite horror movie of all time. Mm. Practical effects, just right. everything. Incredible. But I feel like a close second is Hereditary. Oh, Hereditary is awesome. Oh. It's, it's fun. Up, it's like the only horror film recently that I've seen. I mean, in the last whatever five years and gone. Okay, that was the, actually gnarly. Yeah, that yeah. was like eighties. Totally. Yeah, I would agree. Hereditary was was pretty intense. I mean, the build up is gnarly, and you think that the big scene is that you know the car scene. You're like, whoa, it's over. But dude, the ending is so chilling. I love the ending. It's just, it's just like it's haunting. So many people I know that don't really like horror, but like to be scared we're like oh i liked it until the ending i was like yeah. the ending was the best bit <laughs> yeah, it's like the climax man um sorry i, I derailed you Continue. no it's okay uh lost boys halloween the thing the thing what else we got i mean i gotta go i gotta go old school classics cause the godfather is like probably my favorite movie and that's because of my dad my dad really turned me on to that whole same whole whole you know idea of cinema and even the the subject matter he's, he's italian so I come from that culture on that side. And, you know, it's when you're Italian, it's a very big deal. You talk about how you're oh, Italian a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Italian. And then you get into the movies, you get into the mob stuff. And, yeah, Godfather's incredible. Goodfellas is another one of my absolute favorite movies. I rewatched Casino the other day because I hadn't seen oh. it in so long. Man, we were watching it's Casino. We were watching Casino on tour. And I was kind of, like, astounded at how dark that movie is. Mm. It's just the whole time it's just oppressive. You're like... Fuck. Those two arguing constantly. Yeah. It's fucking, oh, speaking of arguing and horror, it's, fuck off, everyone. Oh, talk about drums. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you seen Possessed? No. Wait, are you thinking of Possession? Possession. Yeah, so I've, Shiv just watched this movie and he's like, bro, you gotta watch Possession. It's fucking crazy. Fucking mate. Sam Neill, right? Sam Neill, yeah. I haven't seen it. I gotta watch oh. it. It's pretty. Is it intense? It's the most intense so speaking of like spouses arguing right the most accurate i don't know if you've ever argued with a spouse or been in an entire <laughs> relationship of it um, got, got a ring don't i <laughs> oh good for you um the most accurate portrayal of like truly toxic relationship mm. in the for the first like 20 minutes or so mm. and then it gets insane yeah and it's the whole i don't know how much they told you but the whole thing is like an allegory for the director's divorce. Oh, dark. And it's super like sometimes overacted, yeah. really deliberate close-up shots, and then crazy practical effect reveal. It's, it's kind of all about the, the main actress, right? Like she, yeah. she's just like wilding out the whole time. She's like, such a great actress. Right. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I, was, wasn't it like banned at some point? Yeah. Yeah, it, too graphic. Super graphic, super... Um, I don't really don't want to ruin it for you, but like sure. there's one scene where you just go... Oh, okay. That's why the practical that's, effect reveal. Yeah, that's oh, that's why they banned it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, possession, not pos uh, yeah, possession. What, possessor is what I'm thinking of, which is oh, uh, that's the Brandon Cronenberg flick. That's what I was thinking. Of. Which is incredible. I could literally talk about 
horror all day. Same. People will be absolutely annoyed at me for not, <laughs> for not talking about music should, should and we talk about, drums. Should we talk about some drums? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, Whatever. We can, we, we'll talk about music and if it divulges into drums. I want to talk about sex, baby. I don't want to talk about sex. I want to talk about foundational nutrition. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you will know that I have pretty much got rid of all of my supplements and all of my biohacking BS because I've been taking AG1 instead. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I take one scoop of AG1 with 250 milliliters of water every single day. Even when I'm on tour, I've got the travel packs, right? Just open them up, stick them in a bottle of water, shake it up, drink it, and it is a godsend when I'm on tour. Two reasons. I don't get stopped at the airport. Mr. What's this powder? Because it's in a lovely little packet. They go, that looks legit. Two, tour is about getting sick and getting stressed, as well as maybe playing some shows. Thanks to the blend of stress adaptogens, in AG1, like ashwagandha, and the immune supporting vitamins and minerals like vitamin C, magnesium, I get all the support I need for those two painful parts of Tor in one scoop. You know I wouldn't be telling you about this if I didn't truly, truly, truly believe it. That's why AG1 has been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash the downbeat. That's drinkag1.com forward slash the downbeat. Check it out. What, um, what are your influences as a musician slash drummer? Sure. I mean, uh, definitely like we were talking about in the early days with you know, Lars Ulrich and Vinnie Paul and Dave Lombardo. And uh, it's actually kind of funny. I took drum lessons for maybe two or three months when I started, when I was you know, 12 or whatever. And um, I was in this little hole in the wall music shop in Dublin, California. I was doing my lessons. I was waiting for my lessons one day. I was playing on these uh, Z Customs, you know, Lars Ulrich, infamous Z Customs. Oh, I, love them. I was like, this is sick. Fuck yeah. And like my drum instructor, Rick, came out. He's like, what are you playing on? I'm like, oh, I'm playing on these E-Customs, man. It's like, Lars Ulrich plays them. Do my drum lesson or whatever. Go home. Come back the next week. Go into my drum lesson. And Rick is like, man, this kid was telling me that the Z-Custom hi-hat sounded good. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about, bro? And I just want to be like, that was me. <laughs> He had no idea he was talking about me. I was, like, I was like, come on, bro. Like, oh, wait, they do sound good. Yeah, they sound they, sick, they right? They so sick. He was being a hater, you know, whatever. But I, I didn't continue lessons too much longer after that. But Yeah, after he smoked you yeah. in person. <laughs> yeah. are, you, are you a Zildjian guy now? No, I actually have uh, Istanbul. Istanbul Ooh, is my sponsorship. That's, that's, I, got, awesome. I, got, I got in so much trouble. My whole thing with uh, leaving. I've never actually talked about this on the podcast. My whole thing, I left Minel recently. Right, I saw that you switched over to Zildjian, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because Minel chewed me out in a meeting. They called a meeting uh -huh. for to chew me out for basically saying that Istanbul make good symbols <laughs> on a YouTube video. And I was like, are you fucking for real? And they were like, <laughs> no. yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to be... Like, I'm not going to go into the huge detail, but sure. it was actually from me complimenting an Istanbul symbol that we started this big argument. Uh, and I was like, oh, "Fuck you guys!" So Istanbul was the was the other lady in your situation, and not even <laughs> it was just me saying they were nice on some. It was like a sleep token reaction video. I was like, "They're nice symbols, I right?" Feel like like they're, they're pretty. They they suit you. Yeah, I think they were great. Um, when I signed up with them, you know, a handful of years ago, they sent me uh, a set of the exist symbols. And they they sound incredible. Are they the dark looking ones? They're they're, they're they're I would compare them to the the A's Zildjian A's. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah not too brilliant, just kind of a symbol. I've always been really basic with my equipment and my my gear choices. I'm pretty pretty standard, very stripped down and simplified. Maybe a little little too simplified. I'd run me, run like, me through, run me through the setup. Sure, yeah. Well, I I got a Tama sponsorship back in 2015. 
Tom up. We fucking love them. Yeah, so good. I got the Star Classic. Um, it's actually discontinued. It's the Birch Babinga. Yep. Apparently, Babinga is a problematic wood, so um, don't make that anymore. But I got the Star Classic Birch Babinga, um, 13 inch rack, 16 inch floor, 22 inch kick, very standard sizes. Uh, then I got a 14 inch by 5.5 inch uh, dynamic bronze snare. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I like the bronze snare. I'm trying to get a new one. I might even get a wood snare soon just to like fuck no. around. No, no. I do the, okay, I played a Black Beauty on a recording and I fucking loved it. That was the yeah. only thing that I was like, maybe I should fuck with the Black Beauty. But uh, so, Is it Sam Gamble that you deal with? At yeah, yeah, exactly. I love Sam. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be happy if you play Black Beauty though. But know. <laughs> you, know, you know which uh, time I do do a symbol, a uh, symbol, a snare that's kind of like a, a Black Beauty-ish. And I think it's, I want to say it's like a, a Starphonic Brass, and it's a 14 by 6. Okay. And it sounds like a Black Beauty. Yeah. Similar. Brass. Yeah. Cool. Similar thing. Because the Black Beauty is black nickel over brass. So. Oh, okay. I, that's how much I know. I thought a Black Beauty was a was a, a wooden snare. <laughs> no, no. It's a black, it's black nickel over brass, Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. And then what's just how many symbols you got? So I got the 14 inch hi hats, a 19 inch crash, 22 inch ride, and then I have a 20 inch ride right here. I was playing a crash over here, but I was breaking it every five shows. Yep. So I pretty much was like, I'm just gonna play a ride, and um, sounds great. So is that a 22 and a 20? Yeah, nice. It's it's kind of weird because they're literally the same symbol but two inches different. And I, I I've never had a China symbol or a splash symbol. Just because I kind of like that washy sound, I like the um, I like the fact that it makes it sound not like a metal song per se. I feel like if you were to add that China tone or that splash tone, it would make it sound a little more metallic overall. And uh, I don't know, I kind of like the idea of just having a wash of cymbals. Yeah, and it comes across when when you record. Is it like I've always thought this because your band is you know it's metal, mm -hmm. but it's very analog sounding, right? Like. Are you doing multiple takes? Are you punching in section by section? Are you... No, definitely not. If anything, we uh, up until Infinite Granite, we recorded to tape. Straight to tape? Yeah. That's how we recorded um, Sunbather, uh, New Bermuda, and Ordinary Corrupt Human Love. Was the the intensity is so insane. Like, no wonder your fucking wrists are fucked. <laughs> yeah. I definitely tried to nail it on the first take because I don't want to play it again. And just that's, full takes. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of the the uh, vibe on it is I just I just want to get it done simply so I don't have to play it more than once. Because <laughs> if I have to record more than a couple songs in a day, by the end of the day, I just won't even be able to play the song I'm trying to play. <laughs> I can't. I honestly can't remember the last time that I recorded a song back to front. I think there's one on the last Stray record where got you because it was just I don't know a different style and everything, but like yeah, you what you were saying about your symbols, the washiness. Mm -hmm. It's like painting like yeah. a landscape of and sound. I, I liked what you said earlier about how um, Sunbather became your sleep album. Um, it was a great compliment because I, I kind of felt that way about the music the whole time we were making it and that it is so drawn out and repetitive in the blast beats. You know, I'm blasting for like three straight minutes at some point. And I think that the, the coolest part about that is the hypnotic quality of it. Yeah. Kind of the, just the hypnotizing, like just wash, just wall of noise kind of thing you can only get it with real blast i think so and uh, on top of that i i play single kick blasts it's always single kick blasts the only time i use a double kick on a blast beat is brought to the water because it's just so incredibly fast Such a good song. and then uh black brick the one yeah. of the newer songs because yeah. i'm blasting for fucking five minutes so i'm just like i gotta use double kick but other than that i like to use single um i mean one because i I can't play like the accents with my right hand if I'm doing double. I'm just not good enough at drums, you know what I mean? Um, and then two, I feel like it just kind of opens up the whole feel of it and makes it sound a little more, not swingy, but just just open in general. Less tight, more kind of open. It, not sloppy, but yeah. It, it's like, the, it's the classic like Euro, Euro blast sound. <laughs> it's the black metal blast. It's the black metal blast. Yeah. And I know what you mean. I mean, I too for all my blasts, but like, and that's just through sheer laziness. But the we've got a couple of songs where it is where I mean you do it the whole set pretty much where there's there's like a group of three on the ride. Oh, like a triplet blast. Yeah, like that's what we call it. A yeah, triplet yeah. blast. Mm -hmm. 
But like trying to do that with two feet, it's it, hard it's, as hell. It like swaps every other feet. It's it super hard. difficult. Yeah, I, I, I to this day cannot play a triple blast with double kick. I can't do it. And then I like to do a lot of, uh, you know, just throwing a little crash in there, a little hi-hat to like match the guitar riff. And uh, if I were to do be using a double kick, like it, it's, it's hard. It's weird. Yeah. It's like I can't get like the accent down. So I just... Fuck it, single kick the whole time. <laughs> what, what pedals are you using for this single kick wizardry? Uh, Tama hooked me up with uh, with an Iron Cobra. Um, I think this is the, yeah, the basic Iron Cobra. Yeah. Yeah, I've been using it since 2015. Can't beat them. Yeah. Like I, a lot of people use the Speed Cobras and the Axis pedals. and I'm, I've just never been like a tech metal drummer. Just, yeah. I, if anything, I'm like a non-metal drummer that kind of just plays metal on top of that. Um, so I just kind of stick with that vibe. Speaking of a non-metal vibe did you get any i mean i'll show you the proof infinite granite it was my top played album of 2021 oh awesome so i'm a oh, sweater yeah. i'm a huge fucking That's big awesome. fan and i loved it like loved it oh, i yeah. didn't and i didn't see any kickback but i just want to know was there kickback uh there's definitely kickback for yeah. sure yeah absolutely um I would say it's, I want to say it's equal parts kickback and, you know, new people finding us. Mm. Um, and there was really no prerogative behind that. It's just at that point in time, we, we wanted to make music that sounded like that. That's kind of been the whole idea of, with our band from since day one is when we get in a room to write music together, we don't have this grand plan. We kind of just, let's go more commercial in this. Right. Line. You know, like, like, you know, you know, no screaming aloud, no blast beats aloud. Yeah. It's, it's, well, that wasn't how it was. It just kind of turned out like that. And, you know, what we, produced and and uh, created just wasn't aggressive um but i do enjoy the fact that mabasa has that mm. big final climax you know which i will say is a sign of things to come as well oh, so we is, have is it coming back not abandoned that you know yeah. I mean? so there'll uh, be people that are desperate to know that i think so i mean i i would quite i'll quite happily when a band changes i don't care like i do this and little note to anyone if i don't like it and then I don't listen to it anymore. It's super it's fucking easy. That easy, right? The other music still exists. I listen to that one. We're all good. Yeah. Uh, that band's usually influenced other bands, and I can move on. Yeah, you don't take it personally. Like, yeah. why would you? <laughs> it's the fucking worst. <laughs> we, um, I would, I would have taken either from Death Heaven. Like, if you continue down that route, I'll, I'll be with you. Hell yeah. If you go back to Heavy, I'll definitely be with you. There's no way that you're not going to do Blast. Like, I know you've got poorly wrists, but... Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blast forever. Yeah, I can tell it lives in you. <laughs> yeah. It absolutely fucking lives in you. When, at what point did you, uh, did you get into blasts then? Because you've got your Metallica, your, your Slayer, mm. your Pantera, Sepultura, no blast beats. Right. What happened? Sure. Yeah, I, I would say it was probably freshman year of high school. After a couple of years of you know running the rounds of you know, thrash and extreme and groove metal and stuff. I uh, started listening to Cannibal Corpse, started listening to Morbid Angel. I started with death metal for sure. And, yeah. Um, you know, expanded from there. Got super into Dying Fetus and Skinless and just all that slam shit. Skinless. I haven't yeah. Skinless in ages. <laughs> well, the horror samples with... Dude, the, for, foreshadowing our demise. Is, incredible record. Is the one they've got something from Puppet Master. Is that on that record? There's, I think every song has a movie sample. Oh, <laughs> it's all over the place. There's the one that's like, I can walk, I can talk, I can even shit my, shit my pants. <laughs> can you shit your pants? Straight into a blast. <laughs> so sick. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, then I started getting into some black metal. Um, when I was freshman in high school, the last Emperor record, Prometheus, came out and it just Huge. dominated every magazine and you know, everyone in the metal world was just astounded. So I was so into that record. I found their older stuff through that and, you know, got into Burrs and the Mayhem and all that stuff. Um, but so yeah. annoying, like, like being a good person and listening to Black Metal. It's <laughs> so difficult to, like, sometimes I'm just like, I'll find a new band and then deliberately just be like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything. I don't want to know anything. I don't want to know anything. Yeah. And it always comes. There's something always fucking happens. Right. That's why it's, it's very nice to have... Uh, an unproblematic black metal band like hey. like Death happy, heaven happy to be here <laughs> we try <laughs> it's just the worst it's so and like without getting myself cancelled like i get it in 1993 when mm. you're a bunch of kids and you're just trying to be the most evil sure 
be extreme. But like new, no, I'm not going to try and go down this because you'll get you'll get a metal sucks article about. There's there's a lot lot to be said about all that, but um, I don't know. I I just I, I also thought it was a little frustrating that that we got lumped in with that at all because they just have zero in common with it. Period. Yeah. You know, like we we don't live in the forest. We we live in the city. You know, we don't live in the middle of nowhere. We live we live in a bustling urban landscape. Yeah. I feel like if anything, our music kind of represented that, represented being, you know, in your 20s, partying, going crazy, living in a city, living in an urban environment, which is very specific to California. And I think we embody that pretty well. Do you ever, did you ever tour with Wolves in the Throne Room? Has that ever uh, been thrown around? We never toured with them, but uh, we played a couple fests with them, and it's always great to see them. They're a fucking yeah, incredible yeah. band. And actually, the drummer who did play on Roads to Judah is playing with them now, uh, Tr Trevor DeShriver. So, really? Yeah. Uh, I I'm pretty sure he's still the current drummer I for think Wolves. Aaron just came back like last uh, week. Okay, gotcha. Aaron took time off and was still writing, but Got wasn't it. going on tour. So I must have, last time I saw them, that must have been what's his name trevor trevor yeah i must have seen them play with him he was really good he's sick he's yeah. great yeah he was in a band called lycus as well back in the day and they're really cool and yeah i just love the light and dark like you yeah. guys and wolves are like give me a wall of blasts mm. then give me something nice yeah bring me back to the blasts like That's i love it something i've always valued about our sound for sure is that we kind of always viewed ourselves as a band that can fit anywhere, you know, yeah. you can play any metal fest, fest, play any indie fest, you know, we play Coachella, we played Bonnaroo, but we also played Roadburn and Decibel Beer Metal Fest. You it's know? literally the dream, to be honest. Like you can play pop festivals. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, like, although these days, you know, you got hardcore bands playing Coachella and, you know, it's kind, had, of, it's kind of taking over, which is cool. We had uh, Demi Lovato posted us on her story. Heard about that. Like, That's awesome. Yeah, there's a there's a cool like me metal or like underground metal is cool again. It's kind of having a moment right now, yeah. I think. Yeah, for sure. Lots of bands um, doing really high profile things. It's awesome. Yeah, I hope Coachella does like a heavy stage or something. That would be year. sick. Like, I mean, if things are going the way they're going, there's going to be a demand for it. You know, I think kids are really excited to see something different, something that's not a DJ, something that's not a rapper, something that's not a pop singer. Just want something a little different, you know. Have you got any like? Have you got any super famous fans? Super famous fans. I mean, I because I would say Demi Lovato is a stray fan now, and I'm like, that's cool. This, like, oh, this is cool. It's a very cool claim. But you uh, must, you must have some. I mean, we You're got a cool we, band. We got a few. I mean, you'd be surprised. People don't reach out as much as you think they would. But um, it was really, really flattering to see Billy Corgan kind of put us on a little bit. That's fucking. Cool. Uh, we played the World as a Vampire Fest. Um, you know, a few months ago, it was fucking awesome. You side stage checking us out. It was really cool. Amazing. Um, it was a crazy story. Um, we played Rock on the Range in Columbus, Ohio in uh, 2017. Yeah. And it was just kind of like a whatever fest. Metallica was playing. They were headlining. We're like, that'd be cool. Maybe we could see Metallica later. And we played at like, I think, 4 p.m. on like a nothing stage or whatever. Getting ready to go on stage, getting ready for a set, getting kind of pumped up. Literally about to walk out, and I feel a tap on my shoulder, and I'm like, it's Lars. No <laughs> I was way. Just like, I was like, what the fuck? He's like, what's up, dude? Like, he knew the effect he was going to have on me. He's like, what's up, dude? <laughs> he was like, no, he said, I hear this is where all the cool Bay Area cats are hanging out. <laughs> I was like, what's up, man? And he's like, yeah, I just want to check out your set. I was like, thanks, dude. He's like, yeah, rock it. And uh, fuck, that would make my life. It was incredible. It was so sick. And and I, uh, I have a friend, Christina. She actually snapped a pic of it, which is incredible. And uh, so we went out there, played our set. And I look over to the right, James Hetfield's chilling there, just like I'm just like, whoa, this is incredible. And uh, as soon as we get off stage, we're like, whoa, that's so awesome. Like, I was just like, man, this is inspirational, which is the craziest thing I ever that's, hoped to hear. You know? That's fucking cool. And he's like, you guys got to watch the side stage later. And, we ended up getting on there. Uh, kind of, it was almost like a, a perch, like above the stage for like yeah. friends and family. Just watch the whole Metallica set, just like rocking out. It was so much fun. Man, that's fucking yeah. awesome. Yeah, very cool. Like, did it? Did it make you play better or worse? I, I think I I, I played perfectly. I it, played great. I would yeah. have. I, I would have activated something in me if Lars Ulrich is watching me play the drums. I'd be like. Absolutely. I'm going to fucking smoke this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not missing a beat. They're so, <laughs> they've got their finger. I'm sorry, it's about Metallica again. Shut up. <laughs> um, they got their finger on the pulse with like younger bands. And it's it's never like, obviously you guys in your time have had some hype, but it's never like 
flavor of the minute hype, like super hype band right now. Mm. It's like the bands that are hyped because they're really, really good. Yeah. Metallica's always got... I remember they took the sword on tour and stuff like that. It's right, like, right. they just like good music. Yeah, they're, they, they know what's up. They're, they're aware. You didn't get a tour off of that. No, and that's uh, something I've been waiting for, but I guess we'll I mean, see. You, I mean, they took Architects recently. Architects is heavy. They played a lot of heavy stuff. Right. I feel like... Yeah, I don't know. I, we, we've kind of thought about that in the past, and you know, if it, if, if it happens, it'll happen. Can't push for it too much. I want it to happen so much. Me uh, too. <laughs> yeah, for, for everyone involved. Um, so Infinite Granite was not to tape. First time not to tape. Yeah. So this is actually the first time we worked with a uh, producer as well. Uh, what, what was the other ones? Uh, so we had uh, uh, Jack Shirley did produce the first the previous three records. But um, I guess when I say producer, I mean someone who was kind of more involved in the writing process. Right. Uh, was there every step of the way, putting the songs together. And that was... Uh, we found that in um, Justin Meldel Johnson, who has actually worked with just an incredible amount of artists. He's a he's, he's Beck's bass player. Um, he's worked oh, wow. with Beck. He's worked with Air. He's worked with so many bands that are just so incredible. How did that happen? Um, I don't even know. I, I'm not sure if he reached out to George or if it's vice versa. Um, I think he may have reached out to George and been like, I just love your guys' band. I really want to work with you. Um, and uh, it was kind of just, you know, it just went off from there. And uh, we were putting the album together back in 2020. We're lucky to have our manager's house or, uh, to hang out and kind of write music at and just spend a lot of time at. And he would be there every day, you know, critiquing the songs, like telling us what works and what doesn't. And he kind of got us on the, uh, the click track vibe, which we've never, never done before. The other records aren't on the click either. No, no, definitely not. I, I, you are inhuman. <laughs> Thank you. That's unbelievable. <laughs> I'm actually mind blown. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I feel like it's a, a distinct part of my style and that I do fluctuate tempo a lot. I, I try to push and pull it. I just assumed it was just programmed in. Like, like it mapped, right? Yeah, because we map ours and it is sure. all over the place, but I'm still a click. No what, click live either. Uh, so we uh, just a click live for Infinite Granite songs. Yeah, once we started doing that record is, is when we actually started using in-ears. Yeah. Um, and the only reason we used in-ears is because of the click track. Yeah, you need it. And since we do use a click track, we can put tracks on, you know, in, into the performance now. You can even do, you know, lights synced up to the, the click or whatever. There's just a lot of benefits for it. But, um, but currently in our live set, uh, we'll play the old songs just raw, and then the click will start just for the infinite songs. So it's kind of like, a, you know, two or three songs throughout the set, we'll have a click. Yeah. But otherwise, just go for it. Do you still stagger old and new, or do you yeah, just chunk definitely. them together? Depends on the set, but... Um, it's kind of cool for me because you know, I'll be playing the old songs, just ripping. I have a new song. You get to fucking chill. I get to chill. It's a perfect breather. And honestly, since we've thrown those infinite songs into the set, like it's been way chiller for me. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, been yeah. awesome. I've had to use the ice a lot less. Yeah, <laughs> oh, the songs are still so good though. Like, if you were explaining Death Heaven to someone who doesn't really know a lot about like underground now what explanation would you give for the genre oh man i don't know i feel like if i if i were to talk to someone that doesn't know anything about music at all i'd just be like yeah we're a metal band but we you know we kind of sound like we're kind of a rock band too <laughs> just just a, a, an amalgamation of rock and metal and everything under that blanket i guess okay so then level up from that someone who does know about metal mm. then what do you say well like what? Like who I'll, do you sound I'll, like? I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you my 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 direct influences for Sunbather's drum performances. Yeah, go. Sean Kinney from Alice in Chains, Trim Torson from Emperor. We just combined the two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fucking cool. Yeah. Man, those videos. Those you seen those videos of Trim at the moment? Still just absolutely Dude. crushing. We had the pleasure of playing with them. We did a th so three shows with them in uh, Japan, of all places. Oh, amazing. So fucking sick. Oh, my God. And they're playing anthems to the Welkin uh, front to back, which is my favorite emperor right yeah, now. So I was just tripping the whole time. I was just, like, fanboying the entire time. And that tempo change in the first song, the first time I ever heard that, whatever, is it Ye, ye, ye Trance? In Trance Imperium? There we go. Ye in Trance Imperium. Ye, yeah. So <laughs> the, the tempo change into the blast beat it's insane is the cool still the coolest tempo change of all time yeah yeah i actually got to play on that kit yeah i saw a trim backstage he's like you want to come up and play i was like fuck 
fuck yeah. Is he nice? He's super cool. Yeah, that's fine. We're, we're, we're talking shit. <laughs> when we're talking shit, we're, we're talking about double kick. And he's like, oh, these, these guys, he's used to doing doubles on the double kick. I don't do that shit. It's all singles. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> like, it's, it hurts when I play. <laughs> and he's all proud of the pain, you know? He, yeah, that's what we're saying earlier. Oh, European. Yeah. European. There you go. Oh, it's painful? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> Sign me up. Um, would you say he's one of your like one of your top influences? Absolutely, I would say he's he's my favorite black metal drummer for sure. Yeah. Um, Hellhammer and Frost are fucking incredible, but um, I feel like they're just speed guys, which is its own thing. But uh, the way Trim opens up the blast and just kind of uses his right hand to hit just the coolest accents and I don't know, just a whole like kind of jazzy feel to it, which I really like. And he's got the the sort of traditional the traditional one footing yeah down exactly do you know who my i'd say my favorite is hmm. i don't know if this is like a, a, a crap answer for like black metal elitist there are no crap answers come on nick barker oh bro nick barker's so sick <laughs> just i remember when that photo came out when he had the black kit with the black symbols and yep. the black sunglasses on black the fuck out <laughs> i was just like this is the coolest thing i've ever seen yeah. But uh, he, George and I connect on that a lot. We were both big time cradle and, and dim you heads back in the day. So. Yeah. The, <laughs> like the first three cradle, the first three dimu, and then both I don't care about. I mean, actually, the new cradle's pretty good. New cradle's sick. Yeah. It's really good. I think, I think it's because they went, they went back to, what's his name? I can't remember. Anyway. Didn't he, didn't he kind of like revamp the whole band? Yeah. yeah. And they went to, who the fuck is the producer? He did Psylosis. Scott Atkins. Gotcha. And that guy just knows like right. a thrashy riff and whatever. Mm -hmm. But Nick Barker's, a Nick Barker's, Elisis DM five drum sound. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well be V drums, but yeah, but like, <laughs> and like the splash work. Yeah, that's what made me have a splash. Now you don't have a splash. You want to chuck a splash in there? I mean, I would have a splash if I wanted to sound metallic. Yeah, true, actually. I want to sound like a little robot that's been sped up. There you go. And, that is, and you're very much I'm trying to sound like a, I'm trying to sound like a warm analog vinyl, you know what I mean? <laughs> it surprised me not, I guess, one foot blast. It surprised me not playing a 24. Oh, uh, do I actually, oh, kick? Yeah. Yeah, I've never tried a 24. Maybe it might be cool. Tw like a shallow 24? Oh. Sound and feel amazing to play. I've actually never not played a 22, so... Could be, could oh, be I worth can see trying. you with a tw twenty four fourteen. Yeah, because so I did I did the maths once because I actually love a twenty four fourteen. It's the same amount as, of air, the same as volume, as, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So you don't you're not actually pushing that much more, mm. but because it's bigger, you can tune it lower. Gotcha. Makes you a lower fundamental note and right. it look kind of cool. Yeah, I mean the way that I tune my kick is like flappy. You know, like barely on there, so yeah. maybe a bigger size would be beneficial. Hey, Sam, get this man a twenty-four. <laughs> I know you're watching, Sam. Come on, get, Sam. Get the man a twenty-four. The Starphonic Brass, or actually, there's another one. I think it's a. I think it's a Stuart Copeland signature. Nice signature Fucking snare. Love Stuart Copeland. Great drummer. Love to have him in that chair. Although I am enjoying you being in that chair. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not Stu, bro. No, 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 you're good. You're good. <laughs> you're from the same coast of the country. <laughs> now, um, what? So, have you got any pre-show rituals? Because you say you don't warm up, you I'm, don't drink, you smoke weed all day. That's, you got that's, anything? That's pretty much it. I mean, if anything, I like to isolate myself. And uh, the other guys, they like to kind of socialize a lot beforehand and even leading up to like going on stage they'll be like having a conversation with a friend like oh i gotta go play now I'm like, it's not really me i like to kind of isolate myself for about 30 minutes I'll, I'll go to the bunk on the bandwagon and just put headphones on and just kind of zone out for a bit then i just kind of go in like almost like i just woke up like all right time to work that's kind of the vibe i like so if anything just relaxing and kind of de-stressing myself as much as i possibly can and then five minutes before set do some jumping jacks and go out there and play. Don't it. even touch Paris Sticks. No. I mean, what's the first song in the set? Uh, Black Brick. Oh my God, you're <laughs> a fucking psycho. <laughs> and, and honestly, Black Brick to me is a warm up because the entire song is a single stroke roll. Every yeah. whole thing, thing, I'm just blah, 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 blah. Do you come at it with less intensity because it's the first song in order to warm up? It's also, it's also the only double kick blast of the set besides the you know, intro brought or whatever. Um, 
So yeah, I kind of just, it, I, it's not the hardest thing in the world for me because I'm kind of just chilling there playing the double kick, and at that point, it's just playing a single stroke for as long as I can. Which is what I do to warm up anyway. Sure, <laughs> exactly, right on. So as I'm, I'm doing it in front of a lot of people, but it's the same same idea. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing you later. There's also another band on um, Void of Light who I share a drum room. Okay, with, cool. With the drummer um, Steve and Stephen. Steve, I don't know. I never. Never like to assume a Dan or a Steve. Just call him Stevie. Um, Steve. <laughs> I think actually he might be a Stevie. Really? He might be right. <laughs> that's, my um, wife, that's my wife's name, actually. Oh, Steve, there we Stevie, go. Yeah. Um, the, Oops. I know what sometimes if I'm like, if I'm in or I have to go and collect something and go into the room, he's blasting away. He's Ooh. a blast, but he's got like a big two kicks. Nice. He's got the Nick Barker set He's got the full-blown metal set So yeah. that'll be, I think they're on, they're either on before you or they're on a different stage or whatever. I, I've not been to that venue before. I feel like that happens nine times out of ten we play a you know, metal festival. Uh, I set up my kit and I'm just surrounded by these behemoths of drum sets. I'm just like, holy oh, shit. I got I my little, little cool jazz set up. I like it better. It's just my style. You know? What's your stage clothes? Uh, kind of alternates, but I, I just wear all black. Very basic. Trousers. See, that's the thing, man. For years and years, I was super stubborn, and I would wear super fucking skinny black jeans. Yeah. And <laughs> it got to the point where it was rubbing the hair off of my legs, yeah. and I had permanent bald spots on my legs from just blasting. Blast, blast alopecia. <laughs> Straight up. So what, do you wear shorts now? Um, I Sometimes I wear shorts. Um, sometimes I wear just like warm-up pants or whatever. Kind of just whatever's lying around. But um, yeah. just really feels... It feels like it's sorry to cut you up. It feels like it's it's such an arty band. If I if I saw a drummer wearing shorts for that band with a small drum kit, I'd be like, dude, that's the exact what's going on here. That's the exact reason I didn't want to wear shorts. Yeah. It's not it, shorts music. Nah, it, you're it's, not, you're it's, not it's on the beach. Black pants music. It know? is. Yeah, but fuck playing in black pants it sucks. <laughs> I just kind of bit the bullet and did it for for super long, but. Yeah, these days I, I either wear I, I do wear shorts on occasion. I'm gonna wear shorts tonight for sure. Are you You're gonna short? Yeah. No AC. Yeah, it's just, I'm just trying to make it easy on myself. You know, this run this run in general is a little rough for us. It's a uh, seven straight shows, um, lots of early mornings and long drives. No bandwagon. You're, no bandwagon. You know, so we turn up in a van. Exactly. Van and hotels. Fuck. It's kind of gnarly. Yeah, we haven't toured like this in a while. So I'm just trying to make it easy easy on myself as I can. And shorts it is. You know. Fuck Where it. are you tomorrow? Do you know? Tomorrow is Edin Edinburgh. 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 Oh, that's yeah. a forty-five minute drive. You are close. Easy. Yeah, I think we're actually staying here. Um, we're staying here tonight, going to play Edinburgh tomorrow, and then back here tonight to stay because it is so much. Yeah, it's so, just nicer here. Yeah, chiller or whatever. Fucking best. Yeah, let me know if you need any uh, recommendations or any of that. Will do. Um, I don't sure. want to take up too much of your time because you've got such a big <laughs> fucking day ahead of you. It's what time is it? It's like I don't even know. Five something. It's no. It's it's six fifteen. Six what 15, time do you play yeah. it? Uh, we don't play till ten, but it would be good to go get some chill time. Yeah, you need show, to yeah. share or you need to eat. I imagine what's your eat? Likely. What's your eating window before? Oh, I usually like to do two hours. Two hours is my cutoff, and I, and I actually have to eat two hours before. What's your go to? Uh, that's whatever's around. I'm not picky. No dietary nah. restrictions. Actually, I do try to avoid gluten. Because really? it, it just kind of fucks me up a little bit. And I think it might have been years and years of just pounding beers, just mm. drinking beer after beer. And just, yeah, got a little bit of a aversion to that these days. Beer fucks up my, I'm drinking a non alcoholic beer right now, but beer with alcohol, like the f fermenting process, mm. messes my sinuses up. Same. Right, last bit mm. before I let you go and have your little chill time and some food. Uh, top five artists of all time. Top five, God, it's so hard. Incredibly hard. I'd like uh, to make you sweat. This is your warm-up. <laughs> I've been sweating the whole interview. <laughs> sorry, it's at no AC, but I'm sorry. Um, all right. I mean, I got to go from like the day ones, you know, when I was when I was a kid and I heard something and it just changed everything. So I got to go Metallica. I got to go Pantera. I got to go Led Zeppelin because nice. Bonham is my favorite drummer. I just think he's... You've got Bonham vibes. He's, he's the best drummer I see ever. you in your slow sections. That, means, that means a lot to me. I really appreciate that. Uh, Definitely need a 24 now. Definitely. That's locked in. <laughs> right? Yeah. A big-ass 24. Um, Coated head, 24. Yeah. Maybe a gong. Oh, a gong action. Huge. Um, I've been thinking about adding a second floor tom, 
honestly. I did it, and then it was an extra thing to set up, and yeah. then, I don't know, I found myself not playing. I had the bigger, so if you got, you got 16, yeah. so you would get an 18. Right. I didn't do that. I got 14, 16, and uh, it was like I wanted to hit the 16, but it was too far away. Sure. I could do 16, 18. I feel like the, the only like significance of it would be to solo. So I can't really see myself doing like a lot of fills, but if you're doing those those bottom triplets, you know what yeah. I mean? That'd be sick. But anyways, Zeppelin, uh, Van Halen. Really? I love Van Halen. And this is a lot of my dad's influence coming out. Nice. You know, he I grew up on rock and roll through him, so uh, Van Halen is just so incredible to me. And um Am I at five? Yeah. No, I need one more. You kind of glossed over the first three coming from one, like Alice in Chains. Nice. They might be like literally my favorite band. I just love that band so much. Every element of them is perfect to me. Their story is incredible. I mean, it's sad as hell, but it's just so heavy. Unplugged is. Oh my god! Just one of the best live just records think, of all time. Thinking about it just gives me chills. Yeah. And then on top of that, Sean Kinney is just such an incredible drummer, and he's the guy that really, really fucks with splashes and chinas. So if I were to make that jump, it would be. And that Sean those, Kenny, those mixes as well. It's such oh yeah. a nice drum sound. It's really sick. The first song that I ever learned to play on drums was uh, was Wood, and nice. uh, I just remember loving that Tom intro. The the whole Tom groove to me was so cool. It really just kind of put me onto that style. I think the first odd time song I ever learned was Them Bones. Oh, nice. Because I remember yeah. I remember hearing it and being like, there's a beat. What? There's a beat missing. Like you can't fully headbang to this. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I'm, I'm coming up. Unreal. All right. That'll do. That's good for me. If it's cool. good for you. It's great. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. It's been I great. I hope you get a Metallica tour. I'm, I'm trying. I every, every day I'm trying. I'm trying to get Lars in that fucking chair right there. Oh, yeah. Well, once we tour together, I'll put in a good word. And I'll put in a good word for you for... <laughs> Seth Myers, because we were talking about that off camera. Hey, let's do it. And on that note, uh, thanks very much. Enjoy your show. I can't wait. Um, hopefully see you again. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank man. you. Thank you.